Welcome to Discovering the Northwoods from the Manitowish Waters Historical Society. We will take you on a journey through our local history with the help of primary source documentation. To learn more about this rich history or about the Historical Society, check out our website at mwhistory.org for blog posts, show notes, our YouTube channel, and a full transcription of this episode. As with many historical works from this era, there are phrases, terms, and descriptions that are inappropriate to our modern sensibilities. The Manitowish Waters Historical Society in no way condones these offensive remarks or passages, but chooses to read this publication in its entirety for educational purposes and accurate historic context. We would like to introduce In Dam, Sturgeon, and Benson Lakes by E.C. Potter, The original source was published in the Outer's Recreation Special Fishing Number in May of 1918. This episode is read by me, Brenna Riley. Editor's Note This is the second of a series of articles by Mr. Potter, descriptive of northern Wisconsin lakes. The first, which appeared in the April issue, dealt with Rest Lake. Other lakes in the Manitowish chain are to be described in subsequent issues, and later, other chains will be treated in the same manner. Our aim in this series is to furnish accurate, dependable information concerning the fishing grounds in several lakes for the benefit of anglers who would like to fish them but cannot afford to employ guides. In the April issue of Outer's Book Recreation, I gave a topical synopsis of the shorelines, weed beds, and bars in Rest Lake, one of the principal lakes in the Manitowish chain, of which there are nine in all. In subsequent issues, I will similarly describe some of the other lakes in this chain, but before continuing up the chain, I want to tell you about the Manitowish River below the dam. The headwaters of the Manitowish are in the center of Vilas County, Wisconsin. In geographically illustrating the great north woods of Wisconsin, Michigan, Vilas County, and especially the northern central portion, might as well be compared to the apex of a cone. From this apex, the waters flow to all points of the compass. The Presque Isles and Onatogan rivers, beginning here, flow north to Lake Superior. Slightly to the cast, and starting in an easterly direction, are the headwaters of the Wisconsin, which soon turn to the south, a little later to the southwest, finally reaching Mississippi. Near the eastern boundary, the outlet of Kentucky Lake, noted for its excellent bass, becomes Pine River, which flows to the cast into Monomi River, which contributes its share to Lake Michigan by way of Green Bay. Numerous streamlets from the southern central portion of the lake starred Vilas County wend their rippling way south to Wisconsin. On the western slope, the Turtle and Manitowish waters join the Chippewa and continue to Upper Mississippi. The Manitowish River loses its identity about 15 miles below the town of Manitowish, where it combines with Bear Creek, the outlet of the Flambeau waters, forming the Flambeau River. The dam at Rest Lake is a bar to the passage of the fish upstream, but for many miles below, in fact clear to Park Falls Dam in the Chippewa River, there is nothing to prevent fish from following their extinctive habit of traveling upstream, making the submerged stumps and weed beds of Benson, Sturgeon, and Dam Lakes their summer home. These three lakes might be best termed bulges in the river, but they are quite as spread as compared to the average width of the river, in fact much more so than the maps show. The Manitowish River from the town of Manitowish to the Rest Lake Dam is one of the most winding of all rivers. While the distance by auto is a matter of 9 or 10 miles, it is said to be 22 miles by water. The trip is an excellent one by canoe as the current is not swift and no difficulties in paddling will be encountered except the rapids between Benson and Sturgeon and Sturgeon and Dam Lakes, and it is an easy matter to portage around them 
for as most everywhere else in the great north woods, in case of this kind, there is a trail. The river probably averages about 100 feet in width, though in many places it is not 50, a winding, twisting stream with clear, deep pools, some large, some small, connected by narrow channels branching off in various directions, making innumerable small brush islands and peninsulas. Most of it, however, is comparatively shallow water. The shores are mainly scrub, timber, and brush, and in a day's trip, you will see an infinite number of small fur-bearing animals, minks, muskrats, martens, skunks, and porcupines, as the shore provides excellent cover. Songbirds fly everywhere, while loons, hawks, crows, eagles, and ducks seem to regard the Manitouish as their own. Occasionally, you will float around the bend just in time to see a deer alertly picking its way along the water's edge or wading across some shallow spot. The portion of the river from the town of Manitouish to Benson Lake is the most winding of all. It is said that in Manitouish, one of the most frequent subjects for a wager, when one of its citizens seems unable to walk decorously, is whether he is embedded too freely of the product that he traveled the worm of the distillery, or has just been out on the river. When the Great North Woods was in the midst of its lumber-producing activities, millions of logs were floated down the Manitouish. Many are jammed in the banks and sunk, and some of the pools, the bottom is entirely covered with them, making excellent cover for fish. There is no resort along the Manitouish River from the Manitouish to the dam, and it is most practical for the average outer to make his headquarters at one of the resorts on Rest Lake and make the trip below the dam a one, two, or three-day camping trip. Good camping spots can be found most anywhere you happen to be. All three of these lakes are very much alike in character. Most of the shorelines are stumps and weeds, and all of it is excellent musky grounds. The average river below the dam is fast-moving water. Here in the Manitouish, the volume of water ordinarily passing over the dam is not large as it spreads out into Dam Lake, covering considerable area, it loses all perceptible current. In describing the fishing ground in Dam, Sturgeon, and Benson Lakes, the maps tell you most all there is to be said. All three are very much alike, and about the only other description that can be given is of general character. Different from Rest Lake, it is not a case of locating a bar or a weed bed in the middle of a clear lake. All three are principally a choice location in which to cast for muskies, or when you have gotten your bearings as a location of a weed bed to troll for them. They are also excellent pike ground. Bass are plentiful in some spots, but your luck with bass will depend on finding where they are feeding, while muskie can be found most anywhere around the weeds in a hooked bends of the river and overhanging alder clumps. The pike frequent the deep holes along the river and nearby water below the dam. They move in schools from one hole to another, and your success will depend on finding where they are. Try a likely spot, and when you get a strike drop anchor and work there for a while. If business isn't good, go on to the next promising pool. All the way down the river are occasionally clumps of lily pads and little sandy points that are likely bass spots and always worth a few casts. In these waters, as above the dam, the pickerel are conspicuous by his absence. Leaving the dam, the banks are very irregular, plenty of snags and weeds and small deep holes where fish are sure to stay. The last time I cast these holes, I got a vicious strike in one, and something started down the stream at the speed there was no stopping. Out went nearly 75 yards of line, and I shut down harder on the reel. I knew I'd have to stop that something some way before he reached the end of my line, but no use. The line parted, and that was the end. We had an old guide with us that day. He said, Oh, about 50 pound musky, there's a lot of them out here. It's just a case of finding where they're feeding and being there when they're biting. Following down the south shore in the south side of Dam Lake, you will find a big, a big weed bed covering the entire south portion. On the bottom, there are hundreds of logs, stumps, and roots, making ideal cover for fish. 
though not the best place in the world to land them, but if you hook a big one here, you will work out towards the center of the leg. You're not apt to lose him. You will lose tackle here occasionally, of course, but what's more important, you will also get fish. The North Shore is similar in character and equally good grounds. Leaving Dam Lake and following down the river, you shortly come to what is known as Little Rapids. A rowboat will practically take care of itself through these. And if you will, watch that it doesn't turn sideways in the current, but if you have a detachable motor on it, you better take it off or get out of the water and guide it carefully downstream, for there is a good size rocks clear up to the surface. If you have a canoe, be careful you don't hit any of them at high speed. Just at the foot of Little Rapids, at times, the bass fishing is excellent. Put in a minnow and let it float down the current and see how quick your line starts off in some direction, other than with the current. Just let it be alone a bit until Mr. Bass has time to turn the minnow and swallow it, and then strike and you'll have something that will repay many fruitless casts. Passing the rapids, we are in Sturgeon Lake. It is said to be at one time inhabited by enormous sturgeons. The guides say there are still some there and that they were seen through the ice last winter. Our guide said our guide said several things about the size of some somebody saw, but this story is detailing facts, not fairy tales. On the east shore where the river enters the lake is excellent camping ground. There is a spring nearby, pure, clear and cold. Sturgeon Lake has some rocks and gravel shores. It is probably best of the three for bass. We found the bass there very fond of pork rind, notwithstanding the guide said it wasn't good bait. In the forenoon, we caught 12, averaging 3 pounds apiece. Our success in this instance seemed to be due to casting back among the rock snags and logs as they would strike after the bait had gone four or five feet, while casts further out from the cover were not successful. While eating lunch near the weed bed on the north side of Sturgeon Lake, we saw a bass feeding on flies at the edge of the bed, so we rigged up our fly rods. Our success was phenomenal, except that the fish were rather small, the average not being much over a pound and a quarter. A bass that size, where the water is cold most of the year, will put up wonderful scrap on the four-ounce fly rod, however. With these exceptions, Sturgeon Lake is very much like Dam Lake, principally a choice location in which to cast for muskies and to troll for them as soon as you get some sort of line on location of the weed beds, so you can troll without snagging weeds. Starting out after lunch toward Benson Lake, we met a party from the Indian Trading Post and Outfitting Camp on Rest Lake, making a picnic trip down to Benson Lake, so we all went down together. They had two large boats with detachable motors. Two in each boat were trolling with wooden minnows and bucktail spoons. Circling the central parts of Sturgeon Lake twice, they caught three muskies averaging about 12 pounds apiece in less than 20 minutes. I don't know what the putt-putt-putt of a motor will do for bass, but it doesn't scare the muskies any more than a red flag scares a bull. Just before you reach Benson Lake, you come to the big rapids. They are not falls, they are easily navigated downstream by an expert at shooting rapids either in a boat or a canoe, and you can pull a canoe up, but a heavy boat you'll have to get out, wade, and pull. The water is about knee to waist deep. The total drop in surface elevation, according to a survey, however, is about 40 feet, so you see there are quite some rapids. Part of the men took the boats down and the rest of us and the ladies went around the trail. Getting in the boats again, we are soon in Benson Lake, which is a short way down the river. It is a smaller lake than Sturgeon or Dam, a sort of basin, averaging probably 6 to 8 feet deep, running to 15 feet at its deepest portions, with a drift log, stumps and snags, and sand gravel bottom, an excellent fishing lake. There is very little deer shore. Weeds and snags line most of it. Benson is not much of a bass lake as sturgeon, but apart from it differs only in location of stumps and weed beds. Like dam and sturgeon, it is chiefly musky lake. In fact, the most vicious strikes I've ever had were in the south side of Benson around the stumps inside the weed beds about sundown that day from muskies that would average about 8 to 10 pounds. 
We did not hook half that struck. They would hit just as the bait struck the water and force their rush would carry from foot to foot and half above the surface. And it was indeed surprising what a noisy splash such leaps make. After trolling around the weeds in Benson, we decided to cruise down the river a little further to where the creek enters the river from the north. This creek is the outlet from Circle Lily Lake, called Lily Creek, and is considered one of the choicest spots for big muskies. It is the same old story, where the creek or the river enters a lake, or another river, it's good fishing grounds. Whether you're fishing for mudcats or muskies, don't make the mistake of trying to go to Circle Lily Lake by way of this creek, however it is not navigable. Here in Lily Creek, we had one of the most exciting fishing experiences it was ever our good fortune to enjoy. For some unknown reason, probably laziness, we had borrowed a rowboat with a detachable motor from the party we had just met. They're taking our canoe, and it was fortunate for us that we had. We swung into Lily Creek and up towards the bridge on the Manitouish Road nearby and prepared to cast some suckers that we brought with us. And for passing over the bridge, it is not uncommon to see a big muskie in shallow water on the sandbar there. The first cast entirely upset our calculation and nearly upset the boat. There were three of us and all happened to make our first cast in the same instant. When the baits hit the water, it seemed as though the place was alive with fish. It was a splash, flop, swirl, and each of us had a muskie hooked. One started downstream, mine started upstream, and the other went to the bottom and stayed there. Foot after foot, yard after yard of line left our reels, and it looked for a moment as though they would all get away. Gradually, we worked the boat to shore, and I got out for we knew if there were ever lines to get tangled, it would be all off. One of the boys finally worked his close to the boat and tried to gaff him, and the fish got a sudden jerk against him, the line parted, and goodbye fish. I worked mine to the shore and shot it, and after getting him landed, they brought the boat into shore and I shot the other one. One weighed 21 and a half pounds, the other 24 pounds, and the one that got away from us about the same size. We fished for over an hour after that around the creek, but absolutely without a strike. Starting the motor, we hurried back to Benson Lake just in time they were almost ready to eat a picnic dinner. It was nearly sundown, and one of the most distasteful things I have ever had to do was to put off commencing on the share until I photographed a bunch going for the meal, which, owing to the spot they had selected, was an extremely difficult job. After we fished around Benson a little while, catching a few small muskie and pike, and then set out for Rest Lake in the moonlight. The tale of how we got there, how we got out in midstream to our waist and pulled and pulled those heavy boats in the canoe in the big rapids with a lantern or two between occasional glimpses of cloud-broken moonlight while the girls went over the trail, how the four girls with two children in a canoe fought their way up the little rapids solely with the paddle and the occasional feminine snarl at each other's mistakes and stroke for all the world like picturesque Indian maids of song and story, how we portaged all the heavy equipment around the dam and got back to camp at Rest Lake at nearly 11 o'clock, might be mildly interesting to some of you. It is a subject of many a comment by all of us since, but it wouldn't help you locate the stumps and bars and weed beds when you wanted to catch a few musky on your own. There is one benefit on the west shore of Rest Lake, however, which I should have included in my description of Rest Lake in the April issue of Outer's Book Recreation, and I will mention it now, as my next lake description will be further up the Manitouish chain. This is the Indian Trading and Outfitting Camp, indicated just south of the dam on the maps of Rest Lake as Indian Camp. I say public benefit advisedly because it is. I believe it is the only one of its kind in the North Woods, and if Mr. Bergen, who delightful story of his last summer in Wisconsin, which had added much charm to persuade of the March and April issues of Outer's Recreation, had struck this Indian camp instead of a young Indian at Flambeau that charged him $8 from Flambeau to Pike Lake, 
it would have never occurred to him to suggest that the railroads liquidate their holdings, go into the auto express business in the Northwoods, and become wealthy beyond dreams of advice. It's factor as the managers of the Northwest Trading Post have long been termed, while the member of the Chippewa tribe is not an Indian but a gentleman from Texas, who would have made an ideal leading character for one of Zane Gray's charming tales of generosity of the primitive Southwest. It is the factor's reputation that no man has ever gone to his camp needing of anything the factor had without getting it, whether he had the money or not. This trading post is but a scant quarter of a mile from Rest Lake Dam. Here you can get practically anything you need in the Northwoods, from half a dozen live minnows to a complete camping outfit, with or without provisions, and at a price more reasonable than you could purchase for the same thing in Chicago. The camp is run more as a benevolent or philanthropic institution out of the good fellowship with the Indians and the Northwoods visitors than for profit. The provisions that have been given away in the past and other assistance rendered without charge to patrons and wandering Indians would appeal even to the most indolent, exp- indolent expedient of the doctrine of thrift. The ever-rising cost of all commodities have forced them to discontinue some of this undue benevolence in the past year. For while the factor and his family have other incomes, there, there must be a limit somewhere. As many know, it is not easy for campers to get provisions and supplies in the woods. The resorts cannot and will not spare them, but here you can rent a complete camping outfit for any sized party and be taught how to use it if you wish. You camp nearby, replenish your supplies at camp, rent their boats, or just stop and get a cake of ice. In fact, get practically anything you want for prices that seem small, indeed to those who endeavored the purchase of necessities at some of the resorts. That the factor of this Indian trading and outfitting camp will never become wealthy is foregone conclusion. They don't seem to care to increase their business or make any profit to speak of their transactions. They say it interferes with their enjoyment of life. Although they do some fur trading with the Indians, which I presume pays fairly well, but such a place in the Northwoods is to a camper an oasis in the desert. Thank you for listening to Discovering the Northwoods by the Manitowish Waters Historical Society. Come back next time to continue this journey into Spider Lake.